So first, hello, everyone. So welcome to our presentation, bringing in compliance for public clouds. Presentation could have been named, be careful when selecting your cloud partner for compliant environments. I hope this topic is not a surprise for you. Um, if you didn't want to hear about security or compliance, you're probably in the wrong uh, talk. So, but if you're interested in secrets for your information, there is also another talk at the same time talking about uh, HashiCorp Vault. So here, what we hope is that after this presentation, you will know how to build your cloud or select your cloud vendor based on your compliance requirements. So let's talk about compliance and security. Well, just in time, right? Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll take it. So before we start, you might, point, you might wonder why are the two of us talking about, about compliance? Well, this is related to the, um, to the company we work for. And here comes the first surprise. You might have heard about City Network bef uh, before, and we recently evolved our brand from City Network to Clura. So Clura is a company with open source at heart, and we, we truly believe that collaboration across organizations and borders leads to great solutions. Clura offers, amongst others, a public cloud, a compliant cloud, private cloud, and managed services. Clura engage heavily in open source, and we have more than a decade of experience in building and globally scaling our cloud infrastructure solutions. We're committed to a data sovereign Europe, where a business accelerate on sustainable open source based and regulatory compliant cloud services. What you need to remember of that is that we focus on open source and have a strong focus on security and regulatory compliance. I was saying earlier in this presentation that this presentation will help you figure out how to build your cloud or select your cloud vendor based on your compliance requirements. This presentation comes from the question that we see from our customers asking, can your cloud tick all those security team, all my security team's boxes for encryption while following regulatory compliance? And after your presentation, you will be able to answer this question for your case. And I'm insisting your case, as I think it's very important. A company is not the other. A business is not the other. Your compliance doesn't mean compliance for another company. In other words, as a cloud vendor, you can take decision for how you design your service, and as a cloud user, you can take this decision on which cloud vendor meets your needs. So, can a cloud take all of a security team's boxes for encryption at rest or in transit while following regulatory compliance? Big surprise, it depends. It depends on the cloud design. It depends on what you need. There is no perfect solution. I really want to highlight that. There is no perfect solution. Every design has its trade-offs. And your experts should know that the design matters. It's not as simple as, I'll provide you an API endpoint. You're going you're gonna to put your secrets there, and it's done. So you might want also to wonder what uh, basically compliance means and what do we mean under compliance and why everybody today uh, talks about it. Uh, so a simple example, we are taking uh, uh, general data protection regulations uh, known as GDPR as just simple example. So uh, you might know that uh, all service providers might obey it, uh, especially in Europe. Uh, if they want to store uh, customized data. Uh, so in case of um, any data leak or violating uh, GDPR, your company might get real huge fines that may take it uh, basically down. And 
it's not only about Europe, there is also CCPA uh, for US or LGPD for Brazil. So basically wherever you are in the world, you need to care about customers' data. And uh, if you want to accept payments, for example, then you also have uh, PCI security standards, uh, which uh, regulate uh, payment account data security. Uh, so while with GDPR you uh, basically don't have any strict requirements of uh, what needs to be set, PCI DSS brings it, and yeah, you will have minimal requirements of how data should be encrypted, what ciphers used, and uh, so on. And uh, on top of that, there is also ISO 27,000 uh, certifications, uh, which describe security standards, and they also require data encryption and rest. So if you want to provide uh, in Europe uh, services for high regulatory businesses, you also likely should be certified uh, with these standards. Uh, and luckily in Clura, we have this. Uh, <laughs> In other words, uh, data encryption uh, is uh, quite basic thing to have uh, these days for any service provider, if they care about customers and their data. Uh, but you are missing slide. No, I think it's no, okay. it's okay. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, we need to, to uh, also uh, select uh, backends. We will not uh, come straightly to the Babicon that we uh, implemented. Uh, at first, we, we, we were considering using HashiCorp Vault uh, because it's uh, quite popular and everybody loves it uh, for basically key storage. And yeah, it looked uh, like a perfect candidate for us to get it at the first place. Uh, its uh, API is highly adopted and uh, used uh, in many places, and OpenStack is not an exception. It also has integration with Vault, so it, it, it sounded like a pretty easy journey. Uh, but, uh, and back then we were considering Barbican just a plan B case, which we can, yeah, use if it won't work out with Vault. And, yeah. So yeah, I'll um, I, I realize maybe that I should uh, I should spend more time on explaining the architecture. So how do you? Uh, I, I mentioned how do you deliver a cloud that take all the security teams boxes while following regulatory compliance, and I, I realized we forgot to talk about the secure supply chain right for the delivery. And that includes your software, that includes the configuration. It's, it's, it's a very broad topic and will not solve this in this session. Just to talk about the supply chain alone, you would, uh, would probably have a talk. And so a bill of material, all of this requires time and effort. What's important here is that when you have handled these parts of, this, of the supply chain, the, the software bill of materials, then you can only focus on the software itself and its configuration. So you need to take the right design decision adapting your configuration for it. So as you can guess, we're using OpenStack, and we're using a deployment system that allows us to easily control the software um, that we deployed. The import, this is important for a secure software deployment to handle the whole chain. What you need to keep in mind is OpenStack is very flexible and it can adapt to your needs because OpenStack is very mature and very flexible. Yet, surprisingly, this flexibility comes at the expense of compliance. So let's go through those. Yeah, the slides are maybe not in order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, what do we do in, in Clura? Uh, what do we wanted when we build our clouds? Yeah, so uh, when we were uh, driving uh, or writing design, uh, we set some kind of expectations and some bullet points we want to cross. Uh, so, and uh, first and quite important is tenant isolation uh, and uh, kind of proper one because stored secrets in storage uh, must be separated per users. And in case one uh, customer is compromised, it shouldn't affect uh, any other customers. 
Uh, and of course, we wanted to provide uh, API for customers so they can store random data um, pretty securely. So, um, and to store data securely, we also need uh, to uh, leverage uh, hardware security modules. Um, and uh, basically why we organized all that is uh, block storage encryption. And uh, obviously object storage <laughs> encryption. Um, and uh, on top of that, we had kind of requirement for load balancers to terminate TLS. As uh, otherwise, uh, in order to do basically TLS termination, you need to store uh, SSL's uh, private keys uh, somewhere in a pretty secure place. And that is uh, yet another thing that we can now achieve with uh, secrets as a service. Uh, and you could also mention that uh, we still have some gouge not field, so we can add more expectations. Uh, and this is images encryption and slow operational costs. Why not, right? Uh, and uh, we um, finally got a tool for that, uh, and this tool is Barbican. Uh, but our slides are not in order again. <laughs> Uh, so why are we talking about Castellan? Uh, because basically all services reach Barbican through Castellan. Castellan is uh, uh, basically a Python interface uh, that projects like uh, Cinder or Nova or even Octavia can use to get to the uh, backends. Uh, so basically, yeah, it's like that. But eventually, as I told, Vault is uh, pretty much popular. So you can uh, configure it as a Barbican backend as well. Uh, so you go through Castellan to Barbican and then store secrets basically in Vault. Uh, but uh, let's uh, probably compare these mentioned options now and why some are better, some are worse. Uh, as I said before, uh, we were, well, first of all, we were considering uh, using uh, just Vault backend, and you can do simply that through Castellan. So basically, uh, Octavia through Castellan just reaches uh, Vault backend, and uh, each service uh, use its, uh, can use its own uh, key, volume, key value storage inside Vault. Uh, but uh, there are some uh, pros and cons with that. First of all, uh, uh, about cons, there is no tenant isolation. So all secrets are, for all users are stored inside uh, key, one key value um, storage. So basically, if it's got compromised, you got uh, all customers' data leaked, kind of. Uh, and uh, on top of that, in order to integrate with HSM, you need enterprise uh, version. While it also brings multi-tenancy in Vault, uh, there is no implementation on uh, Castellan side for multi-tenancy, so you will still use uh, the single user regardless of uh, Vault version. Uh, so now we're going on and we decided that uh, we can add Babicon, right? Because it also can store in Vault. Um, and on paper, it looked pretty nice because uh, with PKCS 11, uh, crypto driver, you can encrypt storages, or you can, um, you can use HSM and leverage HSM for encryption. And at the same time, on paper, you could uh, store secrets in Vault and kind of Bobby can provide sentence isolation and everything good, but there is huge but that you can't use Vault storage plugin and uh, PKCS 11 encryption. So you still don't have uh, tenancy isolation, and now you have two services that you need to maintain, and uh, you still kind of need enterprise for HSM, and uh, yeah, you're just increasing your operating costs and complexity, and basically none of these two tools provide what you need. And on top of that, uh, Vault storage plugin was broken uh, until Xena release, and yeah, now it's fixed, but yeah, still, it's not best solution and what we kind of needed. 
So at the end, we kind of dropped uh, Vault in as idea because it's visit, it's basically no tenant isolation. Uh, and uh, probably I should explain how things work with Barbican because it's uh, kind of interesting and uh, a bit complex. Uh, so in HSM, uh, we store only two things. It's a uh, master encryption key and uh, hash-based authentication code, uh, HMAC. Uh, so uh, HMAC is used to ensure that data is encrypted and it's correct at the authentic. And the master encryption key used to encrypt uh, project keys. So for each project, uh, a unique uh, project key is generated uh, when uh, the user first time uh, creates a secret. And basically this project key is encrypted with uh, master key. And then when you store a regular secret, it's got also encrypted, uh, it got encrypted with project key. So basically, uh, in other words, if you leaked a secret from database, to decrypt it, you need project key. And to decrypt project key, you need master key, and uh, which is stored in uh, HSM. So basically, when you uh, ask for any secret, you go through HSM, and there is also HMAC involved to uh, verify that hash is valid and uh, it wasn't uh, substituted on its way. Uh, and uh, concepts that are quite fair because uh, HSM is uh, basically uh, Hardware modules produced by third-party uh, companies, so uh, drivers are proprietary. Um, proprietary um, which is, yeah, what we live in. And uh, it might be tricky to set up HA for HSM devices, but let's not, uh, yeah, go deep dive into hardware now. Let's limit <laughs> with what we already have. Uh, and we basically spent quite a lot of time understanding how PKCS 11 uh, crypto plugin works with a storage plugin. Um, we pushed some documentation changes, so now it's, I believe, can be more clear if you read through it, it's in better shape. <laughs> yeah, so now that you know more about the architecture, how do you secu securely deploy this? for those interesting into building the cloud yourself in a compliant way. Well, deployment was easy. Anyone can deploy a cloud like we did at Clure. Um, here's the recipe. Um, as I said, we're using a deployment system, and this one, uh, for our case, is OpenStack Ansible. And, well, the first step is to have the host um, in your inventory. You define this little blob of YAML, to, to define the variable that applies to your inventory. You run these three playbooks to, because we are running with uh, system containers, uh, the Lexi containers that you can see. We add it to the, um, to the load balancer with HAProxy, and then we run Barbican and we deploy Barbican that is secure. So if I recap, so far we have an architecture for a cloud. That architecture seems secure, can take the security team boxes, but as I told you before, OpenStack is full of surprises. Yeah, so one of the surprises were when we tried to encrypt object storage. Uh, server side, of course, because we're not talking about client side, it's problem of clients, kind of. Uh, so, uh, according to S3 specification, uh, there are uh, several uh, ways to get server side encryption. Uh, first option is SECC. Uh, basically, it's uh, customer creates and stores a secret wherever it wants. And we have an API now for that, uh, where can, he can do that securely. Uh, but uh, it's not actually handy because you need to provide a secret with, e with each API request. Uh, and uh, yeah, then you need to somehow store secret, and uh, on top of that, not as three tools uh, have this part working. It's either it can be either absent or broken or implemented super recently. Uh, as a nice side, though, that you don't need much uh, 
configuration on storage side, uh, you just need to ensure that uh, our connection is encrypted with SSL all the way from uh, API to um, backends, but other than that, you don't need more. Uh, but another option is uh, SEC CMS. Uh, so basically, you I mean, I forgot to mention that we are using uh, Ceph and Rados Gateway. Uh, so with SEC CMS, Rados Gateway can uh, be integrated with Bobicon, uh, which is a uh, nice side, but um, there are some issues with implementation of that, uh, because uh, in order to integrate with Barbican, uh, you, so basically when you, when you create secret, uh, so basically user still needs to create secret manually, and after that share it uh, with SL rules, with Rados Gateway admin user. So basically we are in a situation when one user in Keystone can read all secrets and basically decrypt all objects uh, in the object storage, which is not acceptable for us. Uh, another issue is that uh, when you're uploading a pretty, I mean, big file, you leverage uh, multi-part upload. Uh, so each object is split uh, by chunks. Um, and with that, uh, for example, you have two gigabytes file, and uh, it's split in like eight megabyte chunk. So you have like 256 around uh, parts. And the problem with implementation is that uh, Rados Gateway tries to encrypt or decrypt each chunk independently. So basically, uh, you can uh, repeat this process 256 times for single file upload. So it means that you get uh, that amount of requests to Keystone, to Barbican, to Rados, uh, to, to Keystone, to Barbican, and to basically to HSM. And uh, HSMs are usually rate limiting, so they are not designed to so huge load. So basically when you are going uh, at some scale of file uploads, it's not, uh, I mean, you're just uh, starting DDoSing yourself, kind of. And uh, we also should mention about Octavia uh, and how it can also SSL certificates that are stored in Barbican. Uh, basically, Clubflow is uh, quite common. Uh, certificates are stored as regular secrets uh, in Barbican. They are owned uh, by a user that creates them. Uh, it's nothing pretty specific. Uh, so when your application asks uh, to create a load balancer that will terminate uh, TLS, Octavia will reach uh, Barbican, should reach Barbican with user privileges. Uh, but for better auditing purposes, it's not using original tokens and provided in request. It creates another token uh, from already existing one. Uh, then Keystone uh, generates it, returns to Octavia, and with that new token, uh, um, Barbican is asked. But why we are kind of uh, talking about uh, like application credentials? Because this flow is broken and it's broken quite early. Uh, so basically Keystone uh, rejects to create new token if original one was created from application credentials. Uh, its issue hasn't been solved as of today. There are like some workarounds in code that can help. But basically, if you want your application to interact in this way, you should just use uh, password authentication because it works quite nicely. So, so if you want to help us fixing that bug, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> and so operations. I'll, I'll just make it a one minute thing. Seems like by now uh, we have a design and an implementation. Does that mean that we can launch the product in production? Well, operations, not that simple. Powering, up and, uh, powering on and migrating a VM, now you need on-demand sharing of the secrets via ACL for, to, to, to do your operations. Planning to reboot your hypervisors? Ask your users to shelve or unshelve the VM or share the, uh, share, the, share the access to the secrets. 
What about your hypervisor that fails? No surprise. You need to, know the, you need to have access to the secret again to, have, to be able to evacuate the VM. So if you have smooth operations and live migrations, it probably means that a secret is shared somewhere. So as you might guess, we're still missing some things implemented from the design we draw. First is image encryption, um, image verification. I'll, uh, I mean, I'm realizing that we, were short on, that we were short on time, so I'll skip that for now. And the FIPS mode and the simple operations. Sadly, operations are not simple when you're implementing Barbican this way. So I hope that we didn't scare you too much. The cloud is no different than other software. You need to take design decisions, and those have trade-offs. No design is perfect. So when you're a cloud vendor, you need to be aware of what your users want and compare that with your security requirements. Sometimes they are not aligned, and this is the start of a wonderful journey for which you will explain to your users <laughs> what they risk if you get access to their secrets, basically. And this is what generally vendors do for convenience. Basically, they grant themselves access to secrets. And if you're a cloud user, you need to be aware of what your cloud sells you, because the operations might have access to your secrets. So should we then consider those as secrets? Some vendors don't hesitate to make those trade-offs for operational ease, and I completely understand them, right? <laughs> it's just that I clear we have taken a decision, and we don't do this. If you have any questions, I'll be just outside. Yeah. Because we're short on time. <laughs> oh, afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Should, should you go outside?